Well, welcome back to another chat with Ann and Joe Scheidler. I'm Eric Scheidler, Executive Director of the Pro-Life Action League. And we are here today, as promised, to talk about the documentary film on, that uh, aired on FX this weekend, AKA Jane Roe, about um, the famous Jane Roe from the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court ruling, Norma McCorvey. And uh, there was a lot of buzz around this film when it first was announced and uh, a lot of headlines about what it was gonna say. And we finally got to watch it for ourselves this past weekend. And uh, I'm excited to hear what uh, my folks who knew Norma McCorvey quite well, going way back to even before her, her uh, conversion to the pro-life side. Um, so what, what they have to say about this, I'm sure will be enlightening to everybody. Uh, welcome, uh, Mom and Dad. Hi, Eric. Good to be back with you. It's like we're on you know, some kind of an evening news thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The weekly <laughs> so, Zoom. Uh, I'll do the Ted Koppel job. Um, yeah. So I understand, uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about the, the film. We wanted to get everything, all of our impressions really fresh, but I understand that you have a little bit different views of, of the documentary. So let's maybe go ladies first. So uh, okay. mom, <laughs> Anne, what was your uh, impression? Um, well, I, I thought that the, um, the director did an excellent job of digging out old footage with uh, Norma McCorvey and some kid pictures of her, her childhood and her um, girlfriend and her um, uh, time as a, a spokesman for the pro-abortion movement and stuff. Um, and of course, her, her conversion and all. Um, but I thought that it, it had too much of an obvious agenda for a documentary. Um, that it was is quite clear he was um, setting it up to make sure that he got uh, what appeared to be a change of heart from Norma at, at the end of her life. I thought the fact that he um, only interviewed the one fellow that last year repudiated his whole uh, history as a pro-lifer, um, Rob Schenk, who still claims to be an evangelical minister, and yet has decided that it's uh, we, we have no right to tell a woman what to do uh, with her unborn child. Um, he had been very active in Operation Rescue, and uh, um, arrested, you know, real active with with um, Randy Terry and with and with Flip Benham. Um, but then, of course, he, he now has changed his mind. Interesting that he is the only person who gets extensive interviews and, and gets to kind of speak on behalf of Norma in a way. Uh, Father Frank Pavone, who, who probably knew her better than Rob Shank did and spent hours and hours with her, um, did a lot of programs with her on EWTN, in fact, brought her into the Catholic Church. He was not interviewed. He had a brief little uh, appearance in the documentary as an extremely young priest. Um, well, he always has looked very young. I mean, only yes, in the he last couple of years he, does he does that. He not looked like a teenager. Yeah, yeah. He was spinning, too. <laughs> yeah, he's, I don't know how he manages that. Good genes, yeah. I guess. But um, And they, they, although Flip Benham is, is interviewed and, and has a fair amount of, of airtime in the show, it's not in the context of what do you think about Norma's apparent change of, of heart here. Um, so so uh, although I think your average person is probably gonna come away feeling like, yeah, she, she was manipulated and she changed her mind. I, I don't buy it. I really don't buy it. You don't buy, you, you would say that she, she went to her death as a pro-life person, but she was just simply manipulated by the filmmakers. She was manipulated by the filmmaker. And, um, and I noticed right away, for instance, they showed a, a tax return. And um, I think we're trying to give the impression that this was Norma McCorvey's personal, you know, uh, yeah. uh, regular income tax re return. And, and I saw at the top of it, it's Row No More. It's a nonprofit uh, um, entity, 990 tax return that, that you submit uh, annually to um, to the IRS and it lists the 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 donations to row no more which doesn't mean any of that money went to Norma McCorvey it was purported to prove that she was paid by the pro-life movement 
to to say pro-life things and it doesn't prove that right at all if you know anything about the not-for-profit world, you recognize that form and you know how things work, but it's frustrating because the average viewer may not have any clue at all if they're really looking. have any idea. No, no. And that was something Monica Miller pointed out in her really great article um, about, uh, you know, reviewing this film as well, um, which we'll link to with, with this, with this um, conversation here. So, Dad, you had, you had maybe a little bit different view of, uh, of the film. Well, I had known Norma for a long time. In fact, she came out to our trial. And she had to wait and uh, had come back because they, they were afraid of having her on the stand and knowing she was a converted pro abortionist. But the, uh, and, and I, I never doubted, never doubted for a second that she was 100% pro-life. She became a Catholic. She was very prayerful. At the end, she called her father Pavone and so on. So I, I had a long talk with Father Pavone, and I, he was going to, he hadn't seen it yet, and he was going to come up with uh, a, a counter uh, film of some sort, and uh, I haven't seen that. My problem was that I, uh, knowing Norma McCorvey, she was, she was so, an unusual person. She would say things, anything that came to her mind. Uh, she was sort of a joker at a time. And, uh, but, but I never doubted her conversion until this film. It is so well put together. I hate to say that, but it really, it, it digs into her past. It's got uh, her whole life story, which was uh, a very mixed up, messed up life with uh, her uh, various uh, weaknesses. And uh, as, as the film ended, uh, and when they came to her rejecting and saying this was all a, a, a put up just to make money, which didn't make any sense, you don't make money in pro-life, I still uh, had to say it was possible that she had re had been putting on an act. It was she had, maybe she had recanted. So do you think she was? Do you think she was faking the whole time, or maybe came to no? I think, have a different view towards the end of her life. I, th I think it may very well be that she did go back to supporting abortion because even when she was pro-life, she was talking about first trimester abortion and a woman's right and so on. She was mixed up. She never had a real understanding. I think she was trying to drive out of her mind that she had been that involved and she was the Roe of Roe v. Wade. And I think, uh, I remember talking one time with Bernard Nathanson and uh, he was still a little bit pro-abortion. Remember when he first started talking? He was we should probably remind um, viewers, uh, if they are not familiar with the history, uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson was one of the, arc, literally, like one of the small handful of architects of, of legal abortion in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, he helped to fabricate some of the numbers that NARAL used uh, at the time, and, uh, but later converted to the pro-life side as a pro-life atheist and eventually became a Catholic. So, sorry to interrupt. Right, no, because some people may not know Nathanson. He's been dead now a number of years, but uh, he converted, of course, totally, became a Catholic and so on. But Nathanson uh, was giving talks, pro-life talks, while he was still doing a first trimester abortions. And he was accepted into the movement as a, as a convert while he gave them up eventually, but I told him one, I met with him one time in Indianapolis, and uh, I just told him, I don't stand up for you and I don't clap for you because I don't think you're 100% convert. And he said, Joe, if I let myself think what I really did, what I'm responsible for, I would kill myself. He said, uh, suicide runs in our family. My father had committed suicide, my daughter, my daughter, my sister rather. And so that he, uh, he couldn't face what he had really done. And I think possibly this was working the same way on, on um, Norma, that she couldn't tr quite accept that she was responsible because of her one, thinking she wanted an abortion, which she never had, uh, that this enormous guilt was, was so terrible that she had almost to take it back onto her mm -hmm. to uh, to face God. I just I don't I don't know, but I was convinced that she she recanted, uh, 
and I, I'm waiting desperately for Father Pavone to come out. This I like what what um, what Monica wrote, but I think she had to fudge a little bit. Um, I, don't, I I I love I love Monica too, but I'm not convinced by her uh, writing that that Norma did not recant and change her mind. I have to confess, Dan, that I, I think I share your view. Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we may learn more, uh, maybe from her family or maybe from those who met with her right before she died. I understand Father Frank talked to her the day or day a couple of days before death or very close to it. Um, but the possibility, uh, I don't know if I would so much, I, it seems to be impossible that she was faking the whole thing. It just, that doesn't add up. Because you're not talking about somebody just going on the speaker circuit and having right. fame and glory. Um, um, you know, this is somebody who uh, was a very, tr very, very troubled person, not allowed to speak at the pro-choice events much. Pro-lifers embraced her, but she, you know, wasn't always very reliable as a speaker. Um, and it seems like she's somebody who really was very needy. She needed to have to be, you know, she wanted to be the big trophy. She wanted to be the big, you know, big fish, she called herself in yeah. the documentary. And, you know, when she's sitting down with this, you know, Australian videographer with an agenda, you know, maybe she wants to convince herself that she thought one way. I, I felt like maybe it was more of a, a, a kind of, um, you know, inconsistency that she, you know, she's just kind of saying what she thinks needs to be said now what people want to hear from her and and that it, it's hard to know what she really did think at any point i'm not sure that she held on to convictions so so tightly and firmly and groundedly that you could say there was a conversion or a flip or a recantation i don't know what words really work why well, i don't wait there are this has happened before i know some other really strong powerful pro-life uh, former abortionists who went back to abortion. In fact, I could go down a little list. I now, I can only think of one other that I can recall, but Joy Davis, who testified at one of our abortion providers conferences, and we lost touch with her, but heard from, you know, through the grapevine that she had gone back into the abortion industry. Yeah. Um, I know some others. I don't want to mention their names. No. But, but um, it just goes to show you how fraught the whole thing is, how incredibly difficult. And we know this, I mean, regular people who have, you know, we've all been touched by abortion in one way or another. People don't like to see the pictures of abortion. They don't like to see the pictures of a fetus connected to pro-life. They, they get angry very quickly when this issue comes up and, and their views start to flip and flop. Right. I felt like they were really kind of Two, I'm sorry, Mom, are you going to add something? I, say, I wonder if, if Norma's willingness to be the star of AKA uh, Jane Rowe um, was just part of her need to be recognized. And because she been, had been sick for a few years before her death, she wasn't out doing any speaking. She wasn't in the limelight anymore and probably had a whole lot less contact with her friends in the pro-life movement um, than she had been used to prior to that. Maybe she missed that or resented that or felt like, well, you only used me when I was useful or, or you only liked me when I was useful. Um, I, I think it, it probably um, is more evidence of her need to be um, considered worthwhile, useful, you know, to validate who she was uh, and here's somebody willing to make a movie about her. That's kind of heady stuff. Yeah. So d does she say what she thinks he wants to hear? Or does he ask questions and get comments out of her and then carefully edit yeah. to take what it is that fits well, with his carefully agenda? Done. Who knows unless yeah. you see all the footage. I mean, you know? We don't hear anyone on the left calling this a heavily edited video, the way they <laughs> yeah. did with David yeah. Leiden, though it obviously is. As yeah. all documentaries are, that's how you make one of those. That's how it has to be. Yeah, I mean, clips together. That's to tell the story you want to tell. There's an integrity to it that the person's actual viewpoint is being presented and not just 
I mean, for instance, when she says, if a girl wants to have an abortion, it's no skin off my ass. She may have said after that, but it's never fair to the unborn baby. And you don't see that piece. That's, that's Nobody very knows. possible, but, uh, but they did uh, add it nicely. I don't think it's going to have the effect, though, that they want it to have. I mean, this is history. Yeah. A lot of people don't know Norma McCorvey, and people are back and forth on different sides, politics like, especially. I'd like to talk about that, 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 that topic about the impact this might have in just a minute, but I wanted to kind of back up and, and just address, before moving on to some other things, the, the, way, the way that her uh, alleged recantation took place, because I noticed watching the documentary that it's really three different interviews. One's in a coffee shop, one's clearly at the nursing home, the other one I'm not sure, but you see three different interviews that play into you know, that, that segment, it's not one continuous deathbed confession. I mean, uh, when she says, you know, they told me what to say and I said it. I, it's, the, it it's the videographer who says it was an all an act. Well, is he talking about the entire 25 years that she's a pro-lifer? Is he talking about the first few times she gave a talk and she didn't know what to say? Because, you know, first time I ever gave a talk, I consulted with everyone I could think of. You guys, my boss at the firm I was working with, you know, my friends, yeah. you know, and some of them gave me advice. That's called coaching. Does that mean that that's wrong? No, I was still saying what I wanted to say, but people were helping me. It was, there's a lot of context we didn't have to know exactly what part of her story she was responding to with those comments. And I could see a way that this may well have been video manipulation completely and that she had no intention of suggesting a change of heart. I can also see that maybe she really did. And this was the best he could do to cobble that together because she wasn't maybe always speaking in declarative, clear paragraphs. Right, yeah. but he did cobble it together very well, whatever, <laughs> whatever, his editing and everything. It's so well done that even uh, somebody who knew her fairly well, trusted her totally, uh, could have questions. Mm -hmm. And I really do. I, to be honest, you know, it comes off the way he wanted it to come off. I'm just saying, how valuable is it? And we'll all find out someday. Uh, she's up in heaven and happy, and she says, "Oh, that, yeah, I remember that. I've been really pulling their leg." You know, she was a funny girl in many ways. And, and I hate to disagree with Monica's arguments, but I just don't think they're as strong as they should be. And that's why I'm still waiting to hear from Father Pavone. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I don't think this is a slam dunk uh, debunking that we can do here. I think there are serious questions that remain. Um, but one area that, you know, this, this film really took on two topics. One was whether Norma McCorvey, Jane Rowe was a sincere pro-lifer or a sincere uh, recanter or whatever. What, what was her level of sincerity? The other question is, uh, what was the pro-life movement's ethical involvement here? I mean, he also talked about, or just showed, showed some of the pro-choice side, and people will come away with their own judgments about that. That doesn't trouble us so much. Um, mm -hmm. But this film is really being touted as an uh, evidence of how horrible we all are. And, you know, Rob Schenck again and again and again talks about how unethical it was the way that they treated Norma. But, and I don't know if viewers will pick up on this, but I found myself asking, how? What was the what was unethical? Taking her in, uh, she she's quoted in you know some of the clips from the past talking about how loved she was in the pro-life movement. People took care of her, you know, tried to find ways to support her financially. Um, in one universe, helping someone out with money is considered Christian charity. In this weird universe of this documentary, it's somehow manipulation to care for someone by giving them the resources they need. Yeah, that doesn't um, make sense, does it? Yeah. Did, did you guys pick up on that? What what was unethical exactly um, that they that they did? That, that didn't ring true. No, and, and I thought, and Schenck didn't give any examples of it. He, he, he just made that statement as if he were supposed to take it on his word. Um, and, and I can't imagine, I mean, Flip Benham befriended Norma out in front of that abortion clinic in Dallas, Texas. And the way he did it, was by telling her, kind of confessing to her about his own checkered background in drugs and pornography and 
and um, you know lust and stuff, and and proclaim to her, "I'm a sinner. We're all sinners," and made her feel comfortable enough to go ahead and have ongoing conversations with him. And in fact, you know, he introduced her to Jesus Christ. What's she, wrong with she that? I love those little girls. And, and just, uh, yeah. Played with like the daughter. Uh, played with them. And, yeah. um, we are told to go out and evangelize, go forth and, and preach the gospel. But if you preach the gospel to somebody and they accept it, now is that manipulative? You've given her, you know, the, the opportunity to know she's forgiven for her involvement in in the abortion decision and any other things that, that may have been wrong in her life. This is good news. You know, forgiveness is usually good news. Being unconditionally loved is good news. Why would you want to deny that to someone if you had an opportunity to share it? Yeah. Well, the poem that she wrote, too, about the empty playground and the swings and so on, that, well, that was, that was so from the heart, uh, so touching, that she had to have been converted at that time, at least. I mean, that, that couldn't have just been uh, something she made, she threw in. So I, I never doubted for a moment until this yeah. goofy film came out, but I have to admit it was, it was so well done that it's got me conflicted. I thought the, the Rob Schenck portions were, were particularly um, maddening from the perspective of sort of truth and honesty. Um, mm -hmm. Not so much, you know, resentment over his, um, you know, abandoning us and becoming kind of Benedict Arnold, but, you know, saying things like, you know, we were conning her or we were playing her. What was the con? We weren't really pro-life and we were just pretending? I mean, are we all fake pro-lifers? I mean, if we really are against abortion and think it destroys an innocent life and a person who is an architect of that being the law comes along and changes their mind, What's the dishonesty there? I mean, we may, there may well have been, and it sounds like there were times that she was, um, you know, asked to do too much, pushed into the limelight way too soon, you know, um, which is a, always a temptation with converts. But not I think it's a temptation on their part as well as on um, our part also, though, because when somebody changes their mind, and realizes I've been wrong about this and I'm responsible for people dying and for lives that have been destroyed by choosing abortion. You can imagine how anxious you are to set that right and to be, to be able to say publicly, I, I disavow this stuff. I didn't, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean this to happen. I, I didn't realize or whatever it might be. And, and I, with lots of people who've come out of the abortion movement, they're, they're anxious to get out. And we try to caution people, take a little time. You need to heal from, you know, what this has done to your own soul and, and your own heart and take the time to, to, to um, think it through, to really recognize you are forgiven and not, not rush into it. But they're anxious to, they want that opportunity to be vindicated. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's intentional manipulation at all to say, oh, look, look, look what we did. We converted this pro-abort person. Come on out here and tell us everybody how great we are. I don't think that was ever anybody's intention. Yeah, that, that was really, that, that was my biggest question mark. And, and my hope for viewers that are not familiar with the movement, they would see through, you know, the fact that they're not really pointing to anything very specific that, that was done, um, or any incidences that, that illustrate a kind of a, a malice or, or lack of integrity, maybe more, I would say more of a naivete. I mean, we want to believe that someone can be instantly converted. Um, and of course, she's the one who initiated a lawsuit to try to undo Roe. Um, right. She tried it for a long time and finally found a lawyer um, you know, that would, would, would take the case on. And I know lawyers that we worked with through the Navi Scheidler case and everything always felt like there is no, no case here. There's, there's nothing you can do about it because the fact that it was based on a lie uh, that she had not been raped had nothing to do with the case. She was, she was attacking the, the, the Texas law, how she got pregnant had no, um, you know, bearing on, on the case. And her, attempt was more of a, um, to make her feel like 
I've given it a try. You know, I, I want to, I want to change this, but there was never any chance that it was going to, to overturn the, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision. So what, what about the impact of a film like this? And, and before I hand it over to you, I, I should note that when I, I turned on Hulu the other day um, to watch something else, um, and there it was on the front page of Hulu uh, being presented as something that I could watch. And that kind of bothered me because, you know, I thought, oh, no, you know, this is this is getting out into mainstream America in a way. Uh, what do you think the impact of this this film might be? They're really pushing it hard. Well, they would be. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that the impact is going to be long lasting. I think it's going to be strong at the beginning. Uh, they've had so many uh, uh, pro boards come over to our side. I mean, we have them outnumbered enormously, but this is an important case. It will have a, an impact. Now, that's why I think, I think Father has to come out with his concert. And, and, and of course, Monica did a beautiful job. Don't get me wrong. It's just that I, it's going to be a, a controversy more than a, have a, a real influence on people's position on abortion. It's going to be Norma McCorvey, did she or didn't she? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, if, if anybody was going to have any other impact, if Father Pavone was going to have something to say, he'd pretty much have to buy airtime on oh, yeah. Hulu as well. And I kind of doubt it, if he's even got the funds to do that um, or would, would want to waste his money <laughs> in that direction. So, yeah. of course, a whole lot more people are going to see uh, AKA Roe than would see anything like Monica's review or our, our Zoom conversation or anything. So yeah, from that point of view, um, it'll probably confirm a bunch of pro aborts that maybe you know she was a fake, but it won't impact any pro-lifers. We don't believe no. in the value of life because somebody who used to promote abortion now does not. You know, it's a whole lot deeper than that. And, and the future of of um, the Roe decision is strictly in the hands of the courts um, at this point. Oh, yeah. So I don't, it won't have any effect uh, on that. And of course, individual states that choose to outlaw it uh, when that goes down. But uh, it's interesting, though, that as we have this conversation, you know, you, what you're saying is when that goes down, you know, that's more and more the way that people are talking rather than, you know, if it goes down. Um, right. We're, we're all kind of coming around to the idea that this could really happen, something I would never have thought was going to happen even in my lifetime, uh, only a few years ago. It seems much yeah, more constitutional. Well, about my sure. lifetime. I, I still <laughs> think it's coming down in my lifetime. <laughs> and, and that's in the air. That's what people, yeah. all, almost everybody's talking that way. And that's the important thing. And what personalities uh, were for or against it. That's not the essential thing. It, Roe v. Wade is a terrible decision. It's unconstitutional and so forth. It has to go out to sort of get some, something straight in this country, finally. But um, no, I don't, think, I don't think it's a major thing. I think it's something that we are concerned about because we love Norma, uh, still do. I think she probably is in heaven uh, or on her way. <laughs> I don't know how more about purgatory, but anyway, uh, we'll find out this was, was manufactured, but nevertheless, it was well done. And it, it, it's hard, very hard to answer uh, without knowing more about her last days. Yeah, you really have to come to it with a, a, a critical mind to kind of wake up and realize, wait a minute, this woman touched so many people's lives, was so famous, but they interviewed literally only five people. You know, mm -hmm. if, I, if my count's correct, there was that abortion counselor, there was Sarah Weddington, um, no, the uh, uh, Gloria Allred, um, Flip Benham, Rob Shank, and um, I think somebody else. Oh, Connie, of course, was in there. Connie, yeah, they interviewed Connie a bit. You know, actually, I, I have to admit, I found her to be by far the most interesting person in this documentary. The one I really wanted to know more about, the one I really felt sorry for, and and in a way, they missed the real story. I mean, can you imagine your, your, you know, your your lesbian lover uh, you live with, uh, your partner of many, many, many years since you were young people, suddenly saying, "No, we're not a couple anymore. We can still be friends. We can still live together." But 
know, cutting that off. And it sounds like they really did, you know, like that part wasn't it. That's, that's why would you act that deeply that even in your own bedroom, you're, you're, you're pretending it. Yeah, that's, that's, a good that's a good yeah. argument. I just really felt bad for her, you know, moral questions aside, just the human sorrow of losing, you know, your life in that way, things you'd expected. I thought that was a fascinating topic. You know, um, and, and along those same lines, we had gone to see the play, Row, uh, that played at the Goodman Theater here in Chicago, and it featured um, the, the two women at, who were most prominent in, um, in the Roe v. Wade uh, ruling, and Sarah Weddington, the lawyer, and Norma McCorvey. Um, but also in the play, Connie is portrayed as extremely caring. Um, the person who Norm is trying to steal some stuff from her little like, sort of convenience store uh, place that she ran, and, and she sees her do it, and she offers her, uh, in the play, they don't say that she gave her the car. In, the, in this documentary, she let her use her car and go run an errand or something and come back. But um, but it, it, both both of those um, you know scripted uh, presentations show that relationship between Norma and and Connie more as a deep caring friendship, and um, and and Connie did did apparently care very deeply about what happened to Norma, and and Norma took care of her when she was dying. Yeah, yeah that that was a really fascinating sort of side part of the of the the whole story that was enlightening to me for one um well before we wrap things up um what advice so uh, would you guys have for pro-lifers who are out there and and there's two camps now we're seeing this in the responses we get and what we're seeing on social media there are people who are are very upset because they believe this is a a lie that this is manipulation and and we're being presented with fake news about Norma McCorvey not being sincere and then there's the other camp that's very very upset because they believe that she really either recanted at the end or that she was faking it the whole time and they feel made of made made fools of um, so we've got two different kinds of negative pro-life responses what can we say to folks to encourage them wait <laughs> <laughs> that's good advice almost always yeah. Well, I mean, all you can do really, uh, you can't ask her. She's gone. Um, pray for her um, and, uh, and realize that you don't base your, your um, values and your, your beliefs in the value of life on any individual person. It's the existential value of life. We get that we are involved in this, not because we admire somebody else, but because we believe that this child in the womb is uh, is a, a child of God, a deeply valuable um, human being, and we do what we do because of the humanity of that baby, right. not because of anybody else that might be a celebrity. Right. The issue is the thing, not the personalities, and we know that. We know where we stand. We're going to continue standing. We're right. They're wrong. And whatever Norma did is. Uh, that her conscience, she has to answer for that. I pray for her, you know, all the time, as I, all, all pro-lifers from the past, and I've known, known so many. Um, I just think we have to um, stand strong, go out and do something pro-life every day, uh, keep our own beliefs strong, and we're right. And so um, it's just one of those issues that comes along every once in a while that um, makes the, in, the movement even more exciting than it is. So I, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I, I believe Norma is a true convert to pro-life. And I continue to believe that. And this didn't convince me, but it was very well done. You know, I think if, if, um, if we take nothing else out of this, um, you know, entire you know, drama, it, maybe, it, it, maybe it's that it's kind of illustrates the power of telling your story. I mean, Norma McCorby told her story one time through lawyers to the Supreme Court and then another, another way where she recanted on the rape part of it to the media. And then she, she began to talk about, tell her story from the perspective of pro-life and then told it again you know, through the ser a series of interviews in this documentary. And um, her story has shifted and changed and moved and 
it's hard to know exactly where she finally landed, but, but if we know where we land, we can right. tell our stories. We can tell our own stories too, because we can't fight FX. We can't get on Hulu with our, with our message, but we can get, uh, you know, in the backyard of our neighbor, you know, over a barbecue, over the fence, and tell them our story. Or someone sitting next to you in the pew at church if we're, when we finally sit in pews again. Oh, yeah, we're that, already. You know, or, you know, at the workplace or whatever opportunity you have, you tell your pro-life story and make that difference one-on-one -on -one, um, that, uh, you know, that you can make by, by sharing, you know, what's in your heart and what you think about things. And what are the chances that Nick Sweeney wants to come and do a documentary about us? Probably kind of zero. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, maybe someday, but until that day, let's yeah. tell our own stories. We've all got our own. Everyone's got a camera right in their pocket. You know? Tell your story. Put it on Facebook. Put it on Twitter. Uh, you know, send it to your friends and talk, talk to people in real life, too, when you get the chance. Right. Tell them why you're pro-life and, and, and why, uh, you know, the testimony of, of one famous person isn't really what we hinge it on. It's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's the whole broader picture that we build together and you know, the, the faith that we have that human life is uh, of meaning. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're not as mean as they make us out to be. I'm not really a racketeer. You know, there's a lot. <laughs> I was watching so closely to see if I'd catch you in the background of any of these. And I know you were probably at some of those events that they, they I felt. Uh, I saw a few familiar faces in some of the old clips, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to break through the media caricature of the pro-lifers and they really try to play up those caricatures in that film. But I thought I was actually encouraged because it sounded like they, they were almost kind of admitting that it's not like that anymore. It seemed like, well, back in those days, this right. is how, right. which I sort of felt was a kind of implied that, you know, things have calmed down as far as some of the zanier activities um, that, that, that we're engaged in. So I suppose that's maybe a positive development. I don't know. <laughs> looking for silver linings sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you have to look for silver linings. Always. <laughs> well, it's a fascinating thing to watch. I, I feel like I really did get to know uh, the Norman McCorvey story better. Um, I still feel like huge question marks about the final years of her life and what she really meant to say and when she said it and what the context was. I'd love to see the raw footage. I don't think we'll get to see that. I'd like to sit but, down with her daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. when exactly did they reconnect? Because for a long time, they, um, they did not, you know, that, that she didn't have anything. To do. And, and her other daughter that was given up for adoption, well, the other two, um, she never, never connected with again. Uh, although she did try mm. to track them down. Um, well, you know, there, hopefully someone will do a more thorough uh, documentary. I don't imagine it'll get as much notoriety and airplay, but at least it'll be part of the records that are out there for the, the day far in the future when this history is finally more definitively written. Uh, until yeah. then, you know, we offer our commentary and we carry on with our fight because we know what we believe. Right. Right. We do. Well, thanks for joining me for this chat. Um, thanks to everybody who's watching uh, out there uh, and, and listening to, uh, to our perspective on this, and especially uh, you know, Ann and Joe, who knew Norman McCorvey over many years and who you know, worked very closely with everyone involved on the pro-life uh, side of things through all the, the years that Norman was active in, in the movement. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us, Mom and Dad. Really appreciate your perspective. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate the offer. All right. And we'll be coming back again soon with another chat with Ann and Joe about pro-life topics that you care about to get a little bit of perspective from folks who've been there for since day one, since the very beginning. Thanks again. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. All right.